Hi, part two of week six, the week after Chusok. Um, I want to focus on the last of the five key areas, topics in our, in our classroom English course. It's called analytic approaches. It is in contrast to synthetic approaches. Um, we discussed synthetic approaches um, as well. Let me pull up an example. If we take these two, now there is one or the other. You're either using the analytic or the synthetic. And if you look at it from, let me see if there's an even easier one. Actually, I think we did already introduce the idea through reading in sounds. And we said when you're using a synthetic or a, let's call it teacher made approach, you are trying to focus on how the sounds are made first, the phonemes, and then building up to the words from there. Um, so as it says there, it starts before students are introduced to the whole words, starting with sounds, um, building up from the small to the big from letters or sounds to whole words and chunks of language. Analytic, by comparison, is taking a more natural approach. It's the way that you learn your mother tongue through how you learn Korean. People don't teach you the phonics, you hear them, and through constant listening, repeated listening, are able to produce them uh, before you understand the meaning, of course. So you're using the whole word first. Students would approach the whole word. They see, hear, repeat words before they do individual sounds. And they're only doing sounds if there's a problem with any pronunciation of words. It says there's taught after initial sight vocabulary. We looked at sight vocabulary, um, all of the words which you have to learn by sight. So if I type in sight words, we came up with a dolce list before of typical words where they're not that easy to produce because maybe they have an unusual production like this diphthong from, fur together, or one, o-n-e, and not w-u-n, for example. So it's words that you need to memorize because they're used a lot in English and they don't follow typical rules. Okay, so we looked at those as well. Um, so that's the basic of basis of analytic. Um, you're giving students the whole language and then looking at any problems as they arise. So it's more of an engage study activate type as opposed to PPP which might be considered as um, synthetic teacher centered approach learner centered approach okay and if we take a look at another one mm, right actually let me find a better one for you a little hard to find easy explanations but this is one. If, as opposed to synthetic that we did last week, um, child proceeds from known, let's say in phonics, to sounds, to unknown words, producing those together, especially in sight words, like one, O-N-E. And the analytic is where they're unfolding the words, um, the statements, the phrases, to try and find meaning. So it goes from the whole to the part. Examples of the analytic method include TPR, which is, um, sorry, TBL, task-based learning. If we have a look at some of these, task-based learning is essentially giving students a larger task that they have to solve usually in small groups, but possibly in pairs together. And here are some typical ones that you might see and use for your classrooms and in our micro lessons. 
information gap activities, um, which literally means, for example, if you're with a partner, you have some information um, that your partner doesn't, your partner has some information that you don't, and you need to exchange usually questions to find out what is missing. So if we have a quick look at this, a typical one is, you know, this kind of um, uh, diagram type. So you can see in the top one, there's my, if I'm A and I have this, I have some things about the placement of the bed and the chair, and the other person has different things. Now this one, it could be about reviewing in, on, beside, under, prepositions of location. So for example, I might ask, where is the chair? And then my partner says, <clears throat> there's no chair. So then they will ask, oh, where is your chair? Or where is the chair? And you will say, the chair is next to the door. Or the chair is between the door and the window. And you draw in or write the missing objects. So that might be prepositions of location, or it might just be finding the missing things. Like, do you have a bed? Yes, no. Do you have a pillow? Yes, no. So that's a diagram AB um, information gap activity. It also exists in kind of pictures like this one. Here's a which food am I kind of picture. And again, um, different students have different ones. So let's say I have column A and my partner has column B, or maybe you have completely different papers. And I ask, so I have this information, you need me to make a sandwich or toast. I have a blank. My partner has the answer to these, so must look through their answers and find, okay, um, what is that, bread or something, or butter, or whatever it might be on their paper. So that's an information gap activity, um, part of task-based language teaching. Get rid of this one. Okay, uh, where were we? Reasoning, right, let's go to, see these ones, reasoning and opinion gaps are much more involved. They are more difficult. You need reason, logic, problem solving skills, not possible in a second language for grade three to grade six students. So typical analytic activities like task-based learning um, wouldn't work for second language or foreign language instruction. So if we go to other ones that you can use, listing and or brainstorming. Now again, this is a typical kind of uh, preparation activity, um, getting students thinking about the key words, coming up with what they already know. Matching, like we saw in last week's videos, um, the CLIL videos, the content language um, integrated learning videos where students are matching a picture with a word, or it could be matching um, uh, sounds in a word, matching the phonemes, it could be matching letters, um, colors, anything. Uh, let's see, other ones we have listed here, comparing, finding similarities and differences. And again, this is getting more difficult because students need language. In, if they want to do it in English only, they're gonna need more language to be able to ask and uh, the questions and make sentences using only the vocabulary and grammar you're focused on. And again, this is getting too difficult. Problem solving, it's not gonna work for your typical elementary school class in second language. So that's task-based learning. And again, the typical activities are more difficult than what you're able to do in your classrooms. Um, so you are generally focused on synthetic approaches, which is where you're preparing the activities in advance, you're working from the part to the whole. Now, to go back to the micro lessons, um, I 
think that's enough on syllabus for now. We click on rubric. A rubric is like a grading paper. It's a checklist for teachers to see what students can and cannot do. This is my micro lesson rubric. It's broken into three parts. I hope I'm not repeating myself, but it's getting closer to a micro lessons, which are, should be starting in week nine, which means week eight will be micro lesson preparation week. Um, and I'm hoping to do a Google Meet class if possible so that I can see you and talk to you about your micro lessons as a class. Anyways, uh, it's broken into three parts and you can consider each as a point. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven points for language, for example, six points for TE, three points for activities. So you're choosing three activities. You're preparing students for a core activity by previewing any words uh, and grammar that they need for this. Then you do the game or activity, which is the largest part, and then you quickly assess them, which might be as simple as a quick test, like I do with my five question assessments. Um, but hopefully it'll be more interesting with the ideas that I've given you in the teacher toolbox. So, mm -mm, where are we? I lost it again. Right. The, hold on. So, TE, teaching English in English, is the doing part. Now, if we don't meet in the classroom, I cannot grade this because I cannot see your actions. I can grade this. I can see how well you've designed your activity for maximum student participation. I cannot see how you're using the screen or the board, so I cannot grade those digitally. Techniques I can, so you'll be again going to the list of techniques, thinking about different ways to make your lesson more interactive, more engaging, more student talk time, and more visually appealing. And materials, I, mm, yeah, I can tell when you're using cards and miniboards, so I can grade that. I can also look, and this is the most important part, at the language you're using. How you introduce your keywords using real questions. Did you use enough words um, or too many or too easy, too difficult? What instructions are you giving? Are they simple and clear? Short, full directions. Examples, whenever possible. Students rarely give and get enough examples. So give is where you tell students we're going to look at colors. For example, blue, green, get, it's where you ask, what other colors do you know? Or what color is my shirt? What color is Sarah's bag, etc. Lots of questions, including this one, making statements, uh, sorry, turning statements into questions where the students tell the teacher rather than the teacher telling the student. Feedback and paraphrasing, we have not covered yet. So those are things where you repeat, clarify a prompt to get maximum student engagement. And paraphrase is where you use different language. Will we do, I think we'll do both of these next week, or uh, right, before we do our midterm assessment. Um, I'll, hmm, I think not sure if you'll be doing an assessment in week seven or not yet. Um, we might just continue with the short quizzes. I probably will do another quick survey to see how you're doing, how much you understand from our lessons. Not many students are in touch. So I hope that means you're comfortable with the medium of communication. Um, our, you understand, and again, you've got you've got YouTube transcripts. It's not cheating to just uh, you know translate it into Korean to check that you have the understanding. Then watch the video. You'll probably get more out of the English as well if you do it that way.
you've already understood the gist, the key ideas, then you get a chance to just listen to the English to understand through English what it is I want from you and respond to any questions in the quiz. So uh, we've been over this, but again, we'll review this next week. I don't want to spend any more time on this today. Um, now, the last thing I'll mention, I think I'm running out of time to do Edpuzzle for this week. I may or may not have time to create this for tomorrow. If I do, it'll be for everyone, just like PlayPosit, to, for those who did it. It'll be interactive questions. Um, if I can get it set up, it'll be graded. If not, it won't. But at the moment, I'm planning to just release the videos with a Google quiz at the end, and we'll get this running sometime in the next few weeks once I've played with it to see how it well it works and how it doesn't. Okay, I think that'll do for today. Um, let me just check what we've got. Right, so I have updated the course content to reflect the changes. So next week, I will look at paraphrasing. I won't look at feedback because I don't think we'll be meeting in the classroom. Um, we'll do a quick midterm assessment, a quiz. Not a big one, just... Um, something to make sure that we're ready for the micro lessons. And then maybe in week eight, I'm gonna release a survey to see if you would like to meet on Google Meet that week instead of a video screen capture thing. So I can see you, I can explain or rather answer any questions you have about the micro lesson, um, which is an important part of your final grade and the different types of lesson and who will be going first etc okay hope you're well enough for now talk soon <laughs>